It's great to welcome to the program today, Aaron Hamlin, who's the executive director of the Center for Election Science. Uh, Aaron, so great to have you on. Really appreciate you joining me today. Great. Thanks for having me. So to begin with, um, most people in our audience, I think, are, are relatively familiar with what is called ranked choice voting, a method whereby one, uh, as the name suggests, ranks the candidates for any particular election or office on the basis of their preference, number one being the most preferred candidate. And we've explored that as an alternative to the voting system that we have a little bit to kind of continue our conversation where we may have most recently left it off with the audience. Give us your sense of uh, where you see ranked choice voting falling in, in terms of preference as an alternative voting system. Uh, what are its pros? What are its cons? Yeah, so I would say ranked choice voting is a modern improvement over what we have now. Particularly, it deals well with elections where you have, uh, say, two major party candidates and a third party or independent candidate, where the third party or independent candidate doesn't do particularly well. Where ranked choice voting can struggle is where there are more than two candidates in a very competitive election, so that third, fourth, or fifth candidate isn't just getting a sliver of the vote, they're getting a substantial amount of the vote. And in those types of elections, ranked choice voting can have some issues, which is unfortunate because those are really exciting elections where voters have a lot of options. Okay, so let's explore what the issues are. I guess we can think of as an example, uh, Ross Perot. I mean, it's been a while now, but he was one of the uh, non top two candidates who had a pretty significant level of support, at least in a presidential election in, in a scenario like that, you're saying ranked choice voting is less, uh, optimal as a system. Why, why is that? Yeah, potentially. And it's not to say that, the, that these issues will creep up every time. Uh, so as an example, there was an actual election in Burlington, Vermont, that used ranked choice voting oh. in 2009. Uh, there, the idea going in was you can always rank your on as favorite as first, but the issue came up there for conservative voters. Uh, there were three uh, major candidates in that race. There was a progressive party candidate, Democrat candidate, and Republican candidate. And what happened was those conservative voters, they ranked their favorite candidate, the Republican candidate, as first. Um, and what happened was there was some vote splitting that had gone on so that the a Democrat candidate had the fewest number of first choice votes. So the Democrat candidate was eliminated and their votes were transferred over. And there were enough votes from the Democrat candidate to move over to the progressive candidate for the progressive candidate to win. Now, what's interesting about that is that had those conservative voters actually either not voted at all, or had they instead of ranking the Republican as first, the Democrat as first, they would have gotten a better outcome. And so these issues where voters are punished for um, ranking their honest favorite as first can come up uh, and also kind of quirks like uh, non-monotonicity, which is when you can rank a candidate as better and it can wind up hurting that candidate. OK, so one of the ideas that some have suggested to resolve that particular issue would be instead of something like ranked choice voting to consider uh, like a single transferable vote. Can you talk about how that system is different from ranked choice voting and how it would deal with the particular issue you brought up from the Vermont race? So single transferable vote is a multi winner method that uses a similar type of calculation process as ranked choice voting, but they're completely different. So the existence of single transferable vote doesn't address any of the issues within ranked choice uh, voting. So with ranked choice voting, it's a single winner voting method for executive type offices. Uh, single transferable vote is a multi winner voting method for at large offices. So therefore completely different scenarios. So when people write into me and they say, David, you should talk more about single transferable vote in order to address the issues of ranked choice voting. These are actually systems that are designed for different types of elections altogether. Completely different types of elections. Yes. Is there a modification that could be made to rank choice voting as you just described it to deal with the issues you've identified? No. Okay. Uh, all right. 
So let's talk <laughs> instead about um, uh, that. That will get us very quickly into another uh, uh, system that I want to uh, bring up to the audience, which we've not talked about as much, which is called approval voting and approval voting, as I understand it. And I know that you'll uh, expand on this is the idea that you can identify on a ballot that has multiple candidates, all of the candidates who you would be effectively OK with being in the office they are running for. It doesn't include that ranking mechanism, but you're saying of the 10 candidates, here's three that would be acceptable to me. And the idea is you uh, sort of build a consensus as to who is uh, most, I guess you would say, plurally acceptable to the voting public to determine the winner. That's right. Yeah. And you, you kind of get at it. Uh, which is it's the voter that decides which what that threshold is in terms of where they approve or where they don't approve a particular candidate. And when you vote in this way, different people might be uh, casting a ballot, one could say, for a different number of candidates, which I know immediately gets people thinking of, does this violate one person, one vote? Ultimately, I, I'm guessing that the answer is, no, once there are these kind of initial tabulations, ultimately you're really only um, uh, uh, in practice voting for the person who has the plurality of support. But how do we more on a technical basis address this issue of does that violate one person, one vote? Sure. So uh, one person, one vote goes back to Supreme Court decisions looking at different uh, populations within districts. Uh, there you could have a small district that has, say, uh, a tenth of as many people as another district, but they're both getting the same number of people elected. So the smaller district is electing, uh, has uh, 10 times more weight than the, uh, than the larger district. Here we're talking about expression within a ballot, which is going after something completely different. So our ballots have the same weight, even if we choose different numbers of candidates on those ballots. So if you choose one person and I choose four different people, I've chosen four times as many people as you have. And yet, if we add our ballots up together, we have uh, a, a five-way tie. So I haven't gotten any particular weight advantage from my ballot just by the mere fact that I've chosen more candidates. One of the problems you identified with ranked choice voting is that the winner in a rank choice scenario may not actually have won in some or all of the hypothetical head to head matchups that could be kind of configured from a group of three or more candidates. How does approval voting relate to the results that we would expect in hypothetical head to head matchups between the different candidates? Uh, so when we're talking about head to head matchups here in voting method speak, we call this a Condorcet winner, someone who can win in all these head to head matchups. Uh, neither approval voting nor ranked choice voting uh, satisfy this particular criterion. Uh, approval voting in hypothetical situations and looking at it does a very good job of electing what we would call this Condorcet winner, this candidate who can beat everyone. Uh, else head to head. Uh, and there are some elections uh, that ranked choice voting has a particularly difficult time with that, uh, such as when you have more than two competitive candidates. How does this relate to the question of the electoral vote versus popular vote in the United States? And to kind of provide some context to, to the question, um, typically the um, oh, oh, let me let me actually backtrack often the advocates of an alternative voting system, be it approval voting, ranked choice voting, single transferable vote for different types of elections, also tend to favor getting away from the Electoral College at the national level. Are the two issues related or can the decisions about single transferable vote or approval voting or whatever be made uh, as completely separate decisions from the broader electoral versus popular vote system that we have in the United States nationally? So there are all kinds of different offices other than the president, presidential office. So uh, when we're talking about, say, like a city council or a state legislature, we can talk about these multi-winner proportional methods like single transferable vote or, or others. Uh, but when we're talking about specifically the presidential election, it's 
it's kind of strange because we have this electoral uh, vote system. Uh, and so there, it actually does make a difference in terms of what alternative voting method we integrate with a national popular vote. Because in addition to the types of winners that a voting method can select, there are also some technical components as well. So when we're trying to tabulate votes at the national scale, there's also something called precinct summability, a feature that some voting methods have. So precinct summability means that you can tabulate totals for a voting method at the local level, take those totals and then add them for the uh, another higher level, like a national level. Approval voting, it's really easy to add up those votes. Uh, you can add them at the state level, take all the sums of the different states, put them together, you've got a national popular vote. But you can't do that with some other methods like ranked choice voting. There you need all the valid data together in one place, which really complicates this issue. So let me see if I understand. If you have ranked choice voting at the state level, the way in which those individual state level elections would be tabulated don't it as easily lend themselves to answering the simple question of what is the national popular vote result because of the algorithm that's used. Uh, that's right. In, in terms of getting those tabulations to add up with other uh, with other states, assuming they also use ranked choice voting. Uh, the other issue there is that ranked choice voting, say you have states using different voting methods, like our current voting method, or choosing one candidate, and another state using ranked choice voting, and they're all trying to figure out what the national popular vote is for a president. Well, you can't add up uh, ranked choice ballots, uh, uh, or ordinal or ranking ballots, alongside our choose one ballots, but what you can do is if you have states that are kind of not matching in terms of the voting method, you can add up approval voting ballots with our current choose one ballots. That data can add up together, but you can't do that with ranking methods and our current choose one method. That's interesting. So if states are not using the same method, if some states decide to go rank choice, other states decide to keep the system we have, some other states might say we want to do approval voting or whatnot it actually reinforces keeping the electoral method where each state is essentially holding its own election and saying, here's how our electors are going to vote because of this kind of incongruency between the different methods. That's right. Trying to use ranked choice voting and have that coincide with the national popular vote, it just doesn't mesh at all. OK, so if a priority was to replace the electoral college with a national popular vote, which systems are the ones that would actually work with that? The easiest one really would be approval voting. And it's because of those two factors. One, it's precinct summable, which from a pragmatic point of view makes it a lot easier. And then secondly, it works well with holdout states that aren't using approval voting yet. Can you explain that? So if, if, if you have one or two states or however many that have not switched over to that, how is it that those results from those states would be integrated? Sure. So you have like your normally your, your your normal results from an election when you choose only one candidate. There will be a certain number of votes for each particular candidate. Uh, with approval voting, you have the same thing. Uh, you have a certain number of votes for each candidate, and it, the the uh, the total may add up to more than the total number of voters because voters can choose more than one. But you can still just add those up together. So there's no issue there. Absolutely fascinating stuff that we will, uh, of course, continue to cover, particularly as different states consider different voting methods. We've been speaking with Aaron Hamlin, who's the executive director of the Center for Election Science. Uh, Aaron, really a pleasure having you on today. Thank you very much.